Yeah, they all want to be the same good, no matter what they have. She turned on the staff and bothered this way. She turned on the staff and bothered this way. Wow. During worship, I was thinking how you guys are like a, a kid with a new bicycle. You're not quite sure what to do with it yet. You know, and, and, and I remember the hill by my house where my dad taught me how to ride, and he just took me and rolled me down the hill, and I had to start pedaling, or, which I didn't do. Actually, I ran out of steam, and the bike tipped over at the bottom of the hill, but... But you begin to learn, and, and, and even in here, I'm thinking, you got all this space up here during worship. What are you going to do with all this space? You know, you, I, I thought you could play even do cartwheels across the front here. <laughs> I couldn't, but somebody could probably do cartwheels across the front. But it's just amazing. It's a, it's a blessing, and, and uh, you guys are, are blessed, and you know it. Amen. And, you know, it's a blessing, a time, you know, uh, a, a blessed time to be here. Uh, today, uh, I was thinking about a, a, uh, the merging. As we, we came down Friday, we walked around the building, and, and we know and we preach that the church isn't a building, don't we? But yet, places are significant. You know, the garden. God placed man in the garden in a specific place. He, uh, you know, the... the the places God created, His plan for us to, to dominate the earth and to, and, and to, you know, it's significant. And as we were walking around and I thought about the heritage in this building and the attention to detail that's here. You know, you, you have a merging of, of, of ministries. You know, you have the Grace Fellowship of Morton, which you, you all have changed the name, right? It's Grace Fellowship of Groveland, right? And, and you have... Uh, Terrace life, and then you have this ministry that was here, and, I, and I've, I've thought that, you know, as we looked around it, it could be a discouraging time for the, the congregation that was here, uh, you know, like, oh, you know, we've, we've poured our life into this place. Even the details like the little bell, uh, isn't that going up to the children's church? There's so many nooks and crannies around here. I can't remember every, everything was, but, but there was a bell to let the children know that it's time, you know. That's attention to detail, wasn't it? And, and men and women of God have prayed over this specific spot for years and probably cried at this altar if this is where the altar was when the church was founded, you know. And, and, and that, that's significant to me that spiritual place that you hold here. That's why you all have it, because you honor that. And you have you know, a heart to continue and, and fruit to remain. So, so uh, Pastor Joe asked me what, right before the service, what's the title to your message? And I'm like, I didn't really think about that. Usually at home I have a title, but I feel pulled in so many different directions today and, and things that I'm just feeling in my spirit that I didn't, it was hard to even put a title on it. So I think I told him uh, 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 something to do with impartation, a place of impartation. And so I want to look, if you will, in Genesis chapter 1. Even the acoustics in here. When you're in worshiping, I'm thinking this, this place is just full of worship, amen? Genesis chapter 1. Verse 26. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. You know, we like to hunt in Indiana, and that's one of my favorite scriptures. We say we're taking dominion over the beasts of the field, you know, or, or when we're fishing. We don't, we don't go fishing, we go catching, amen? And uh, because we take dominion over the, the fish of the sea. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, 
and have dominion, again, over the fish of the sea and over the fowls of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. So I was thinking about that, and I get funny illustrations. So, and you all have a very nice door here to put the illustration behind. I just see your children coming through here with drama. You know, what an entrance. Amen. So I was thinking about this illustration, if you will, how God placed man in the garden. And then he gave him, I, I thought of this rod, this walking stick that we use when we hike, uh, that he gave him authority, didn't he? He didn't just place him in the garden. He gave him this rod to represent, you know, my, in my illustration, authority. So not only did he place him just in a, a, the garden, he gave him a place of authority. Amen. And then we know that something happened, didn't it? The devil came along and convinced man to give up his place of authority. So I, was, I had to order this off Amazon to find something to me that represents the devil. My wife thought, what are you getting? So along comes the devil. The, the catfish. And took man's seat of authority. Hold on a second. There we go. <laughs> you know, Scripture says that when we see him, we're going to say, that's the one that caused all the trouble, right? And that's the only thing I could find. That took me about two hours on Amazon to find the right one. Last Friday that came, I, I, kept, I asked Missy, did my package come? Did my package come? I called home from work. And she's like, yeah, it is. I said, well, go ahead and open it. And then she's like, what is this? <laughs> so you'll know at some point. Amen. But that's the what I see. He came and took that place of authority that Adam had. Because Adam gave it up. And, and uh, Adam and Eve gave up their place of authority in the garden. Now let's go to Colossians chapter 2. By the way, I don't need to really take that back to Indiana if somebody's really got their heart set on that stuffed animal at the end of the... <laughs> Colossians 2, starting in verse 8. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Excuse me. Probably should close this door. <laughs> Amen. Hey, we love the sound of children in Indiana. Amen. It's a blessing. For in him, verse 9, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. So Jesus came back, right? And in him, we are complete in authority and power. That word power there is the word exousia, which is you know, when you see power in the uh, New Testament, it's either, it's usually one or two words. One is dunamis, which means like dynamite, right? And in other places, it's exousia, which is authority. So, Jesus came back and regained man's authority in the earth. You all have a place of authority here in Groveland. You know, man has regained that seat of authority. 
So basically, Jesus, let's just think how to do this. He just kicked him off that seat of authority, <laughs> right? And, uh, <laughs> and, and got that back for us, right? But we have to not only be born again, we have to take back our authority. Amen? I was thinking of this message because I was really preparing, even though I was feeling pulled different directions, I knew it was uh, going to be a uh, conference on evangelism, and I thought, Lord, this doesn't really, how's this fitting with evangelism? Well, you know, you cannot take a territory unless you know the authority that you have. Amen? As believers, we can declare some things. I love how you all open with declarations. You're declaring some things. You're taking territory. You know, even, uh, I didn't realize, even coming up, how all roads lead to Peoria. Even coming up 65, this is the exit for Peoria. There's lots of cities in Illinois, aren't there? But 65, Peoria. All the way here, Peoria. You know, this is an international place that you live. You know, I can just see missions, missionaries coming in and out of this area. You know, it's significant, even in the state. Probably more significant than, than Chicago Amen. in this state. You know, so even, you know, the geographical place you're at, I just see it as significant. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. Starting in verse 1. And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in times past ye walked according to the course of this world. You know, there is a natural course of things. I had a brother was sharing with me uh, one night, and uh, we were, and, and I could tell he was, he was, uh, if you will, just kind of sliding back in his faith. The natural world was getting him down. What he saw around him. And, and to uh, almost to make an excuse for that, he told me, he said, well, you know, there's a natural course of things. You can't really change it. You know, things happen. It, it almost made me think of back uh, before I was saved and people would say, say, you know, life's rough and then you die. So you better have some fun while you're here, right? As an excuse to just go out and, and blow the doors off and party all weekend, right? Because, you know, it's, it's, we don't know when we're going to be gone. There's, and even I hear Christians say that. Well, you know, when it's your time to go, it's your time to go. I'm like, well, you wear a seatbelt, don't you? <laughs> right? You don't go outside, you know, in the wintertime with your hat off, right? You don't... You, but, you know, people don't even think about what they say sometimes. But, but you know, there is, a, there, there is a natural order of things. But it says we in times past walked in that. We don't walk in that now. You know, he's, he's assuming that he's talking to born-again people here. He's assuming he's talking to people who are supernatural people. Who no longer walk according to that natural world and that order. We don't have to walk there now. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. That word power there, again, is authority. So in times past, we walked under the natural course of things that was controlled and governed by that goofy looking thing over there, right? But now we don't have to walk according to that among whom also we all had our conversations in times past in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God. Let's say that. But God. Every one of us hopefully has had that but God moment. Amen? Amen who is rich in mercy for His great love, wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ. 
By grace we are sa ye are saved, and has raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. You know, backing up a little bit in verse 6, it said, He has raised us up together. He's talking present tense, isn't he? Right now. Not future, not in a sweet by and by. You know, we used to, to uh, when I got born again in a little Pentecostal church, and it was, it was, it was lively, happy group, but when I'm, I'm thinking, I'm amazed how happy we were because some of the songs we sang were, were not so happy. Like we were clapping our hands, but it's like life's rough, but in the sweet by and by, right? Then we're going to get our reward. And uh, not realizing that, you know, we have right now seated with Christ in heavenly places. Amen. I got to be careful. Don't offend anybody. But, but, you know, some of the music we sing just doesn't line up with Scripture as Christians. You know, and sometimes we have to be careful about even what we sing and what we say. And, uh, and I was, I was uh, talking with Pastor Bob about uh, music and how I don't really see a, a separation between secular and Christian music per se because sometimes the Christian songs that I hear are, are more unbiblical than some of the quote-unquote secular songs we listen to, you know, and, and, uh, and hear. And uh, I'm not saying go out and buy your heavy metal CD this afternoon or anything. But what I'm saying is, there, you know, sometimes we are too quick as Christians to draw this line between the world and us instead of going into the world uh, and, and, and meeting the people where they are. But, uh, but we have something special to offer, amen, and I'm going to get to that. But, uh, amen. I think I'm down to verse 8 now. For by grace ye are saved through faith, and it's not of our, yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. For ye are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. You know, so we are created in Christ Jesus for good works. He's bought us back, hasn't he? He's given us back that seed of authority that that Adam and Eve gave up, amen? And all those saints that have been in this place praying, all the prayers you've put forth, you know, it is not without a, a, a purpose or fruit, amen? So having that seed of authority, how do we use it? Well, let's go to Mark chapter 11. I was, was preaching a while back at, at church and, and uh, I said, uh, let's, go to, let's go to Mark. Where's it at? It's Mark. Where's it at? Yeah. And it's where it talks about moving the mountain, you know. And, and for some reason, I, I forgot where it was in the middle of my message and I thought, you know, they're going to kick me out of the faith camp. <laughs> they find out I don't know where Mark 11, 23, and 24 are. How we operate in that authority. You know, when, you, when you're witnessing to someone, you should operate in authority. You should believe that they're going to get saved. And when they say, I'm not ready, say, when, well, when you are ready. Well, no, I'm not sure I ever... No, when you are ready, here's where you need to go. We go to Romans 10, 9 and 10. Uh, you know, when we, when we lead somebody to the Lord, you may have other scriptures you use. But now, so I'll point it out to them and say, well, when you are ready, you know where to go, right? Even speaking words of faith, when we're witnessing, when we're declaring things over our children, our grandchildren. And you know, well, when, when it's time, you'll know where to go, right? Because you're going to get saved. <laughs> Verse 23, And Jesus answering said unto them, Have faith in God, for verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith 
shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. You know, in, in southern Indiana, I like, I've been on this, this uh, uh, thing for the last couple of years, actually, where I, I've kind of studied people that were uh, generals in the faith. How many's ever read some of the books like Generals of the Faith and, and great, great books? And, and, and uh, one, one of them, I think the first one was how some of them succeeded, how some of them failed. You know, and it was interesting that that stood out to me at Apostle Callahan's memorial. I was sitting there thinking how here was a general that didn't fail, that lived a life of integrity right up till the end. You know, but in, but in southern Indiana, where I'm from, there was a a man back in the '60s named William Branham, and he is in that book. You know, God's general. So. So I've kind of studied him to some degree just because of the geographical area where I'm at, I'm at and the influence he had there. Uh, there was, there's a train track that comes up, runs along Interstate uh, 31, and my uncles, had a, one had a restaurant right after World War II, and the other one had a garage. And William Branham worked for public service, so he would come up the tracks, you know, and I, I just imagine him on one of these things, but I'm sure it was motorized, you know. And, uh, but he would come up the tracks because the electric lines for public service ran along there, and he, he was in, in inspected that. And, and he would come in there and eat, and they, so they all knew him. You know, and that, so I know people that knew him personally. I've got a, a, a cousin that lives about three doors down from me who's in his uh, early 70s, I believe, when he was five or six, got prayed for by William Branham because of a heart defect he had. And I can tell you the enemy has tried to take that man out multiple times, hasn't he, Melissa? And he just keeps hanging on, right? And, uh, you know, and he was prayed for from that healing ministry. The man had a, a, a documented, well-known healing ministry. Now, I wouldn't recommend probably some of the doctrinal things that, that were taught, you know, that, but, but even in that, uh, I think that a lot of that was his, the people that followed him after his passing. But anyway, and, and studying that, but, but I was reading on him, and he liked to hunt. And how many have heard of him and heard of the healing ministry he had? Even uh, Oral Roberts, uh, what, what's the man that started, started Christ for the nations out there? Um, Gordon Lindsay. They all spoke highly of his ministry at, as healing. You know, I had I talked to an old uh, minister there, and he said he went to one of his meetings and said, "Man, he would just call people out and all things you know about them, and that nobody could have known, you know, where they came from, what highway they they drove to get there, things of that nature, and very in tune with the spirit." Miraculous healings. But I was reading this story about him once, and, it, and it, it revealed something about how he operated in the miraculous. Okay? And the story, he was talking about squirrel hunting. And he, he, was, he loved to hunt. And in this story, uh, it was basically, they, they dictated what he had said when he told the story in church. He had killed the year before he had killed 130, over 130 squirrels. So he was, you know, and now this was the next year that he's hunting, and, and he, was, he was hunting and he was having a, a, a rough time. It was, a, it was a windy day, and he hadn't seen a single squirrel. The sun came out, and he decided to take a, a nap, basically. He sat down and and, and, and begin to meditate on Scripture. And, he, and the Scripture he was meditating on was Mark 11, 23, and 24. And while he sat there meditating on that, he said he's, his uh, testimony is that he heard the Holy Spirit speak to him and, said, and the Holy Spirit said, what do you want? You need to say it, what you want. You need to speak it. So he said, well, I'd like to kill at least three squirrels before I go home. 
And then, well, first he said squirrels. That's what I want. Today I want squirrels, right? Some of y'all got these little animals uh, in your backyard. You're thinking, how in the world could you not kill three squirrels? You know, when you get out in the woods, it's a different thing. They're not used to eating out of your trash can in the woods, right? So, or, uh, so he said how, and then he said that the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, how many? He said three. And then he said the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, where? So he considered it, and there was a sycamore tree, which squirrels normally don't see a squirrel on a sycamore tree. So he said, Lord, if I'm understanding your word correctly, I should be able to call a squirrel out on that sycamore tree. So he said, let it be on that tree right there. <coughs> and a squirrel pops out on the limb, and he shot the squirrel. Then he said, a locust tree. He said, wow. Well, how about that locust tree over there? Squirrel runs up the locust tree, he shoots it. The third time, it was, he, he said, well, how about, how about having a squirrel run across that cornfield in front of that guy's tractor, those guys that were in the field? Here comes a squirrel out of the, went up the tree, killed three squirrels. And I thought, what if that man's entire ministry, all these testimonies of healing, all, everything we've heard about them, all boils down to the very fact he just believes Mark 11, 23, and 24. Do we declare things? Do we believe it? You know, when we see somebody, do we believe that God can even save that person? Can anything good come out of Indiana? It's faith. Now I realize I'm only here by faith. Amen? <laughs> and, and as I was, was praying you know, that, about that revelation of, of authority and thinking about meditating on your all's congregation, and, and I didn't want to... I, wanted, I, almost, I almost included gray hair in the title of the message. Because you all have... A lot of seasoned individuals in your <laughs> midst. Somewhat Amen. Uh oh. Sue's looking at me from the back. By seasoned, mature believers. Amen. So I thought, I don't want this to be you know, offensive or anything, but I was just thinking about the congregation as a whole and. And, and even, even some of you that were young, the first time I came, I think like you, you two, this couple here, Jeff and, and his wife, were fairly young. Even you are, are more mature now, taking a place of authority in the, in the school system. And, you know, and I believe that you're going to see a lot of younger people coming in here. And even your pastor preparing you for that by saying, we're going to need some children's workers. Maybe give up a Sunday a month because they're coming in, right? And what an opportunity for them. When we started front, Frontline Ministries, we targeted young people. And I found out something. Within about two years, young people aren't very reliable. I went to a pastor friend and I said, you know, how's the ministry going? I said, pretty good, me and Missy doing it all. But we're reaching some young people. Uh, you know, we baptized 13 people that first year, and a lot of them were young, young and, and, uh, and unreliable. I'm not being mean. It's just the way, maybe it's the, court, the place in life. You know, they're struggling. They're trying to raise children. And, and, and so I, I asked uh, this pastor friend, I said, yeah, you can agree with me. I'm thinking I'm needing some older people in the congregation, more mature. He said, well, you know, that is more biblical. Right? A, church, a biblical church will have all generations, right? And, and they'll have young and, and old. And, and, and you all don't have a youth group yet, but I can hear them in the background. You're going to have them before you know it, right? They're going to be entering in that age group. And, and so I was thinking about this being a place of impact. Psalms 92. 
you, you all understand that when I say gray hair, that's symbolic, right? Like ma maturity. See, the, the course of this world acts like gray hair is a negative thing. But the Bible says gray hair is a positive thing. You know, the course of this world will say uh, we want young and significant. But God says I want faithful and mature. Amen? You know, moving right along. It's almost like I'm, it's almost like I'm um, how would you say that? I'm almost sound like a politician. <laughs> Polishing it over before they raise your taxes, right? <laughs> I almost prepare you before they hit you with the tax increase. Okay. But, you know, I'm saying this in a very positive thing because I see this house is very, very strong. Amen. We're going to be starting in verse 12. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like the cedar in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall bring, they shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing. Just, <laughs> I'm halfway there. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> oh man. To show that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. You are, in the, you're, you are seeing the fruit of a righteous life. Even, even this building. It still just amazes me. Amen. How God has blessed you. Just almost overnight. Probably didn't seem like it here. But to us it's been pretty much like oh. Man, this is, this is just remarkable. But ye shall bring forth fruit in old age. All those seeds you planted. Amen. You know, when we were thinking about evangelism, and I was praying about you guys, and the, the ability to impart that you have into a younger generation. I would have loved to walk through these doors when I was 29 years old and gave my life to the Lord. To have that wisdom, that, that security, that solid place to, to, to rise up. I was thinking about something we used to do in our, our cell groups. Like, you understand, you all know what cell groups are. They're small groups. And, and when me and Melissa were new Christians, uh, we were in, in a church, and they, that's how we really answered the call to be a pastor. We served in a cell group. It was a group of about eight or ten people. And as it grew, uh, they, they asked us to be cell group leaders, and so we started doing a group in our home. But in that group, we would do something called the hot seat. Y'all know what the hot seat is? The hot seat would be, we'd put somebody in a chair in the middle of the room. And everybody get around them and pray for them. You know, I, I, this has been on my heart for, for about three weeks. Uh, I shared it with a group of people and said, hey, we're going to put a chair down here. Uh, we were, and, and we're going to pray for whoever needs prayer tonight. And one person did it, and everybody else was like, I ain't getting in that chair. <laughs> but after we prayed for about a couple of people, then people's like, I'm next, I'm next, put me in the chair. And it, you know, it, it's, it's, we call it the hot seat. And, and when uh, I was thinking about coming up here and praying, I kept seeing almost like a military terms kept coming to me, like, like a campaign. Well, then the pastor began to share about your, your, you know, hanging these on doors. That's a campaign, you know. And I, and I thought about a blitz. You know what a, a blitz is? That, that's where they come in by sea, by air, 
uh, you know, it's like they're going to attack the, this, uh, this area and they're going to do it from every direction. And I was thinking about a spiritual blitz. And that's what the hot seat was. Somebody, they're beat down, they're discouraged. You put them in the hot seat and everybody starts praying for them, laying hands on them. People start speaking wisdom over them. And they come out of there like happy, free. Wouldn't they, Melissa? I think I'm going to put you in the hot seat today and have everybody... <laughs> but you understand, but what you have the ability to do as a church, to me, is put somebody that's new in the hot seat. And they don't even know it. They think they're in the back row. What they don't know is they're in the hot seat. You understand what I'm saying? I'm going to make it so it's like spiritually, they're in the hot seat. All of a sudden, and you know, who knew who gets the happiest praying for people in the hot seat? Or who gets the happiest? It's the people praying for them. It's a release. Nothing, there's nothing better than being used of God. And for Him to use you as a group to do it. There's nothing better. I, I mean, I don't know anything. I, I've killed, uh, I'm a deer hunter. I killed my first deer. It was exciting. My grandson killed his first deer. He was happy. He was crying. He was apologizing. Papa, I'm sorry. I'm crying. I'm just so happy. That doesn't even compare to someone giving their life to Christ. Or being set free from an addiction. Or their marriage restored. I mean, we, who can have more fun than us? Nobody. You know, and, and that's, that is what I call a spiritual blitz. You just love them and you let God do the work. Amen? And, you know, they're out there all around us. So it's a campaign. And what do you impart? One thing is wisdom. Let's go over to Psalm 71, or back to Psalm 71. Sorry, guys. They're following me back there on the scriptures. I do this to my church all the time. I'll say a scripture and then I'll go back three and the guy in the sound room will be looking like, where are you going? I want to start about verse 10. For my enemies speak against me and they that lay wait for my soul take counsel together saying... God has forsaken him, persecute and take him, for there is none to deliver him. O oh God, be not far from me. O oh my God, make haste for my help. Let them be confounded and consumed that are adversaries to my soul. Let them be covered with reproach and dishonor that seek my hurt. You know, people are beat down and bruised. One time... Uh, I was meditating on the scripture that, you know, he prepares the table before me in the presence of my enemies. And I said, Lord, who are my enemies? And he said, the people that want to see you fail. Sometimes family members want to see you fail. They don't want you to rise up higher than them. Sometimes co workers, they act like your friends. They don't want you to be promoted. I begin to see, oh, yeah, you're right. It's the people that want to see you fail. They want to see harm come to you. Uh, they'll buy popcorn and set up chairs to watch you fail. <laughs> Let them be confounded and consumed. Verse 13, That are my adversaries to my soul. Let them be covered with reproach and dishonor that seek my hurt. But I will hope continually and will yet praise thee more and more. My mouth shall show forth thy righteousness and thy salvation all day. For I know not the numbers thereof. I will go in the strength of the Lord, and I will make mention of thy righteousness, even of thine only. O God, thou hast taught me from my youth, and hitherto have I declared thy wondrous works. Now also when I am old... 
and gray headed. Amen. Oh God, forsake me not. Until I have showed thy strength unto this generation and thy power to everyone that is to come. You know, there is a time in life to, that it's an imparting time. When it's no longer about yourself, it's about other people. I think, you know, when I was a young man, I spoke like a young man. I was ambitious. Uh, you know, I wanted to accomplish so much. And as I've gotten older, I begin to realize it's more about what we impart. Me and Melissa, the, the, the kids will bring the grandchildren over. How many got grandchildren? Amen. It's different having kids, isn't it? Kids, it was a don't touch this, do that. You know, you pay attention to the direction you're, they're supposed to go. But, but grandparents is totally different. You don't have to bring the correction per se. But I look at it strategic. When my grandkids are at the house, they're in the hot seat. We don't set them in a hot seat, you understand? But this is our opportunity to impart into them. It's our opportunity to straighten everything out that their parents are messing up. <laughs> Amen. It's not, not quite like that, but do you understand what I'm saying? I see it as so critical. I used to, uh, you know, I was busy about many things as a young man when my, kid, when my kids were little. I'm trying to start my career. I'm trying to put food on the table. You know, the, the older kids say, Dad said, you, you spoiled the younger ones. I said, no, we just had a little more money with the younger one. You kids were lucky you didn't starve. <laughs> right? And, and, you know, by the time the third one come along, we, we were a little more in, into our careers. We had a little bit extra money. You know, we, could, we, could, we didn't have to put generic Cheerios in the real Cheerio box anymore, right? <laughs> or buy the cheap ice cream and hide the swan stuff in the back of the freezer for me and Missy, right? <laughs> that, you know, there was... <laughs> but it's different. You, when you get those grandkids... I've got four hours to spend with them before parent, the parents come back and get them. You look at it different, don't you? This is an impartation time. I don't have time to, to sit down and waste time watching TV. They're, you know, they won't let you do that anyway. They're too, you know, drawing on your attention and things. But, but you know, you, you, you learn to, sit, to turn the phone off or put, leave the phone in the bedroom, right? There's a time of impartation. And, and wisdom that comes there. That's the way I see your church when people come in here. They're in the hot seat and you got them. Amen? You give them your attention. You, you love them. You treat them like they're the grandkids coming in for a visit. You celebrate them. You know, I had a wise man told me one time, if you don't celebrate your, your children and your teenagers, somebody else will with wrong intentions, right? If we don't celebrate people when they visit us, somebody else is going to with wrong intentions. You all love people, don't you? So you got that, you know, what, you know, what better place so one thing, you know, a campaign is, is, and what we give people is we put them in the hot seat and we impart wisdom to them. And then we lead by example. Let's go to 2 Timothy. Chapter 1. My son, we're, we're rejoicing. Uh, how many's ever been to Little Nashville in Indiana? It's around Brown County. It's down about probably 70 miles north of Louisville. Beautiful area. Recommend going there sometime. It's a nice little quaint town. It's an artist colony, they call it. And, and uh, 
and uh, we have spent a lot of time there. But my son has just taken the varsity coaching position at Brown County High School, which is in Little Nashville. And we're just rejoicing because now, hey, we can park the camper in his yard, right, <laughs> when we go there. But, uh, but my son is 27 years old. And I, I, I think of him, I've thought about Timothy often over the last two weeks while he's been applying for this job and waiting to hear about it. Because in our hometown of Henryville, my son is the JV basketball coach. And, you know, the scripture says a prophet is without honor in his, his hometown. People look at you a certain way when you grow up in a small town. And they think that, you know, you need more experience and you need those, you know, type of, of things. So when I, I read Paul talking to Timothy, Timothy was in the game and Paul's directing him because he's got the, the wisdom and... The, and, and and my son had, um, you know, I've, I've heard the people say, well, you know, we hate to see him leave. We think he needs more experience. I know he doesn't need any more experience. He needs to jump in there and get his hands dirty and, and, and learn, you know, learn on the job. And, and, do, and, and he's going to be a success. I know it. He's going to prosper in this endeavor, you know. And, and, and because he's, he's jumping out of the boat. Now, we don't like it, you know, that per se that he's moving an hour away, but we're rejoicing about it because that's what we've trained him for. You know, Scripture says, train up a child in the way they should go, and when they're old, they won't depart from it. And we used to teach that or heard it taught a lot about you, teach, you keep a kid in church, you know, and when he gets old, he won't be able to get away from that. But as a parent, we grabbed a hold of it. Each one of our kids had a different way to go. Right? My son, he would... When he was seven, he would go starting to play basketball. He'd come home and I noticed something. In his room, he'd be drawing the plays out on paper. I thought, who does that? A coach. He, I've known he was going to be a basketball coach since he was seven years old. I personally don't even like basketball. I can't name you a basketball player. I'm kind of glad, in a way, there's a part of me saying, hey, if he's in Little Nashville, I don't have to go to all the games in Henryville, right? I just don't, yeah, it's not something that interests me. But because he was interested in it, we pushed him that direction. I made sure I went to every game. He got where he quit asking me for advice because he knows I don't know anything about basketball. I even offered to be his assistant coach, and he said no. <laughs> Amen. But Timothy's like that. As way I see this with, the, with Timothy, he, you know, he was a young man. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve from my forefathers with a pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee being mindful of my tears that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, without which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that is in thee also. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by putting the putting on of my hands. So two things that was imparted to him, to Timothy, well, a, a number of things here actually. One was faith, right? He had learned faith. He had learned to stand on the word. You know, my son's going up there into a town where he doesn't know anyone in an environment that can be very competitive and, uh, you know. But I have no, no fear at all because I know that he has faith. We've declared these things over him. We've, we've uh, trained him in the way he should go. He's launching out in, in that area of faith and we're just, we're just 
so pleased that, that I can't even put it into words because I know he has been fashioned for this from the time he was seven years old. And he's not going by the course of this world. He's going by something that we've taught him, which is supernatural favor of God. Amen? And when someone comes in here, part of our job as Christians is to train them up in the way they should go. And then release them to do that, isn't it? What a joyful thing. You all have got so much to impart, man, but you just need to be covered up with, with new believers is what I believe. Because you could just start dibbing them out. Okay, you take these three and you take these three and, and you know, we got our hands full. Not just children in the children's church, but spiritual children. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. You know, when I, I, I read that, it, it, it just now it jumps out to me, but he said, God, because I have, I, have, I have quoted this so many times in situations that we're facing, God has not given me a spirit of fear. But Paul's saying to Timothy, God has not given us, me or you, a spirit of fear. Amen? And there's that uh, releasing of imparting wisdom, imparting spiritual gifts in the new believers that is a, not only a, uh, a joy, it's a mandate that we have from God. Amen? That when someone comes in, they, they are the center of attention. We build them up just like we did our children and we send them out. And wherever that is, amen? The Bible tells us to train up a child in the way he should go. And that's what we're supposed to do with new believers, amen? You know, when, when uh, we were in worship and it was just hard for me to enter in, I guess, to a spirit of, of joy because I was so happy when I pulled in here and, and, I, and rejoicing, even did a little video, you know, and, and uh, I think I caught Pastor Joe yelling, he didn't know I was doing a video over there, he's yelling, hey, get in there, you know, and I got him in the video and, and I'm just rejoicing over your all's place and, and the joy and, and that, that you have here. But when we came into worship, I started feeling just a, I want to say a heaviness. I couldn't hardly keep from crying during worship. And, you know, thinking about what God's done for you all, God, and what, what He's going to continue to do. And then, Brother Danny, when you came up and prayed over the offering, you're going to see the fruit of, if you're in your wife's life. You're going to see young people coming in. All those seeds that you planted, you're going to see fruit from that. You're going to have stories to tell. Amen? Amen. This, Pastor Vicki, Karis Life, you had a ministry. You could look back at that and say, you're, you're, you could look back at your all's ministry and say, well, well what? The, there's been a shift there. You're going to see the fruit from, from, that you planted in this place. Amen? This congregation that left here, the people could drive by and have, have, it, have be thinking, this is somehow, you know, you know how the enemy will get in there and make people somehow feel like they failed. No. They didn't fail. There's been prayers and, and for years prayed in this place. And it's going to continue to, to bring fruit. Amen? Amen? It may not look the same as a Mennonite church. It may not look the same as Karis Life or Grace Morton. You might have a different group of people in here. Amen. There may be some colorful <coughs> tattoos in this place. <coughs> Amen? There may be some... some uh, some people that like different styles of music than you're used to. But you're going to see fruit, amen? amen. Stand to your feet, we're going to pray.
Hope I didn't go too <coughs> short on you guys. <laughs> Amen. If you all are used to, to being here a little bit longer, I'm sure we got enough preachers in here to keep you here all afternoon. <laughs> Amen. But I know when I'm at the end of my message and went to, to, to land the plane. Amen. <coughs> I just want to pray for fruitfulness. Allow the Lord to, to speak. Melissa, if, any, if God, you got anything on your heart? That's my counterpart from Indiana over there. Amen. But I just, you know, want, want to take a moment and pray over this congregation. Father God, I thank you for this group, Lord. I thank you for the, the seeds that they've sown over the year. Even in this new place, Lord, uh, of uh, destiny, I pray, Lord, for uh, increase. Even as Pastor has said that, you know, has already called the, the, the request for help in the children's ministry, Lord, I believe that's because they're going to see the children flow into this place. And they're going to celebrate those children. Father, I pray for young families to come with children looking for direction looking for a place to 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 plug in father your word says that you set the solitary in the families this church is like a family these people lord you know are like family to one another father i just pray for those that that don't have a connection to find their way here Father, I pray for the, the divine connections over the next week, over the next two weeks. I just pray, uh, Lord, that uh, each person will recognize uh, when, when that was an encounter from you, Lord. I pray that you give them eyes to see and ears to hear. Father, I pray that uh, even as, as, as uh, we talked about the hot seat, Lord, and, and we've seen so much fruit in that, Lord, that, that uh, Father, this truly is a place to come in and get built back up. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen.